So um, just to emphasize before we start that this is the draft of the new subject benchmark statements um, for biosciences. Um, the final version will be coming out in around about February, March next year. Um, we've got a QAA code and a link to the draft at the end, though, so you can actually go online on the QAA website and see the draft. Um, you don't have to wait for February and March for that. So Samra and myself um, were both on the um, advisory group for this set of benchmark statements, um, along with Catherine and a variety of other people. Um, we were on the subgroup looking at EDI and accessibility, among other things. Um, and that's what we're going to go through now. So I'll start just by giving a bit of background in case there are people that don't know about the benchmark statements. So the QAA um, are the Quality Assurance Agency for Higher Education. They're an independent membership body. They're not a, a subset of the government. Um, although they do work with various government agencies um, on occasion, producing some of the reference points, things like the quality code for higher education. But the subject benchmark statements are done um, on behalf of the membership by the QAA um, and uh, people from the subject area. So the subject benchmark statements have been produced for more than a couple of de uh, decades now. Um, I don't know, I hope you can see that this one will be the fifth edition for biosciences. What they do is they cover the, um, the academic standards and what is expected of graduates within subject disciplines. They're about program design, uh, basically, uh, and review. They cover what a graduate might reasonably be expected to know, um, do and understand at the end of their degree. But as I say, they talk about it from the perspective of program design um, and what institutions should be covering. And their advisory, as I say, they're, they're produced on behalf of the membership, which is, I believe it's more than 300 higher education institutes within the UK. So that's the majority of higher education institutes. So this suite of benchmark statements are the first ones which have included um, wider social goals. For instance, equality, diversity and inclusivity, accessibility, but also things like sustainable development and entrepreneurship for the first time. Um, the first kind of cohort, if you like, of benchmark statements was published earlier this year. Um, and the next suite of which biosciences and also biomedical sciences will be part of will be published in kind of February, March time uh, next year. I'm going to hand over to Salma now. She's going to talk you through the rationale behind the approach that we took. And also she will cover the EDI side of things and embedding EDI within the curriculum. And then I'll talk about the accessibility uh, further on. Great. So just to start with, this is a list of everyone who was on the Biosciences Advisory Group, and we've highlighted those in particular who were on the EDI subgroup. So there were four of us, and together we wrote the sections on EDI and accessibility, which we'll cover today, but also education for sustainable development and employability enterprise and entrepreneurship. Just in terms of where we're coming from, so I'm a recent graduate of the University of St. Andrews in biochemistry, um, and my experiences are in promoting anti-racism and racial justice in higher education. And it's actually just a good point to acknowledge that as we move through the benchmarks, we thought it would be useful for this presentation to identify some examples of how um, institutions can work toward those benchmarks. A lot of them have already been covered, and there's loads of examples that, that we could use, but we'll be pulling kind of from our personal experiences and backgrounds, so I'll use a lot of examples from work in anti-racism but with that being said obviously everything that we're covering today is applicable to all identities communities groups and, and forms of discrimination and i'll quickly let kate also introduce herself yeah i probably should have done this before <laughs> handing over so i'm from the university of liverpool um, where i'm a lecturer in genetics molecular biology run the genetics program um, but i've also been very involved in supporting disabled students and um, particularly neurodiversity so sort of both from a professional and also um, a personal perspective so that's the angle that i'm coming at this from uh, mainly back to you <laughs> cool 
So in terms of our rationale and approach when writing up these sections, the first thing we wanted to do is to be aspirational and think beyond the legalities of just the protected characteristics in the Equality Act, because we know they can be quite limiting in terms of inclusivity. And by doing that, we wanted to be as inclusive as possible to make sure that everybody was going to be represented, everybody was going to be valued and have full access to the curriculum. We didn't want to prescribe uh, institutions with specific instructions as to how to fulfill the benchmarks um, because we know every institution is different and we want this document to be as future proof as possible so that hopefully you can have a long term impact. Just to summarize our mission statement, we are promoting inclusivity throughout the benchmarks, not just in the EDI and accessibility sections. And we are advocating for the proactive and intentional support of diverse student bodies by promoting equity of opportunity for all by valuing diversity, by treating everyone with dignity and respect, by supporting aspirations, and by enabling people with diverse identities, abilities, and backgrounds to succeed. And we've referenced that course providers, staff, and students should all have a responsibility in promoting equity and in challenging discrimination. So also in our mission statement, we've said that bioscience courses should be encouraging openness and participation. They should be creating environments where everybody feels respected, valued and supported. They should be providing equitable access to educational opportunities by both anticipating and accommodating for the varied requirements of students. And this is something that hopefully Kate will speak to later as well. And then finally, they should be regularly reviewed and updated in line with institutional guidance and also promoting equity and inclusion. And actually, it's probably a good point to, um, to, to say that obviously we're talking here about EDI and we're doing that in a, um, in a space where we're talking about decolonization. So it's just important to acknowledge that obviously decolonization is very rich. It's not a buzzword and it's definitely not contained within the remit of EDI. But I think I at least have seen that the EDI seems to be a lot more um, palatable to institutions and a lot more embedded. So whilst you find that some of this is branded as EDI, we've definitely tried to be aspirational and think above and beyond that and consider, for example, decolonial approaches to education. Cool. So on that, the first theme um, in our EDI section is getting educators to promote social responsibility on bioscience programs. So firstly, we've asked educators to contextualize their fields, right, because we know that science has been shaped by and has shaped a lot of um, violence in the world that is reproduced in the inequalities that we see in our institutions. So we've asked educators to consider and engage with how their fields may have benefited from or indeed perpetuated social injustices. It's also important for educators to contextualize influential scientists and to refrain from uncritically glorifying them in the classroom, especially if they, if they have perpetuated um, prejudice or indeed benefited from it, because we know this can risk alienating students from marginalized backgrounds. Secondly, we want educators and students to develop the critical thinking skills that allows them to proactively and hopefully independently engage with constantly questioning our practices in science. We've talked about how science isn't apolitical, it's not neutral, and we want students and educators to consider how things like culture, bias, society, all influence the biological sciences. How do these factors influence what questions we ask, what methodologies we use, how data is interpreted, who we value in science, which communities are going to benefit, which communities are going to be harmed. So one example of this could include, you know, critically challenging power dynamics in science, such as those that might privilege um, researchers from highly resourced countries and contribute to, like we've already talked about today, parachute science. And by doing this, we've asked educators to decenter overrepresented voices in science and amplify underrepresented voices in science. We want educators to challenge knowledge hierarchies and challenge that notion of authoritative sources of, of information. And again, an example of that, which we've been talking about, um, could include challenging Eurocentricity and Western bias, and crucially starting to incorporate teachings on indigenous knowledge systems and indigenous practices. And then finally, we just want to make sure that as, as we're incorporating more diverse um, um, case studies and sources that we're doing that responsibly in a way that doesn't perpetuate any stigmas or stereotypes. We've also asked educators to start to um, acknowledge the contributions of scientists with diverse backgrounds whose work is often neglected. 
I think that all students should have the privilege of understanding the role of their communities in the scientific development of the modern world. And again, educators can also consider the contributions of communities that are traditionally branded as unscientific. Thinking again about indigenous communities who have often had their, their knowledge and their resources and even their DNA be exploited and appropriated through, for example, drug discovery or population genetics. Secondly, we really want representation to go deeper than just diversifying reading lists. So we've asked for educators to create opportunities for their students that allow them to situate their knowledge in light of their lived experiences. I think we've had some really good examples about how we can do that. And I think that this intersectionality provides some really richer opportunities for, for more interesting discussion. And indeed, we've said that curricula should be recognizing that the contributions of scientists with diverse backgrounds can provide different and more intellectually interesting insights. And then finally, we really need educators to constantly engage with the ethical ramifications of research and to get students to think about how biological knowledge and technology can be exploited for political, commercial, capital ends in a way that can further exacerbate social inequality. Okay, and I'll pass over to Kate to talk about the accessibility sections. Okay. So the accessibility uh, section um, doesn't just refer to disability, although obviously that's a really important part of this. Um, what we want is equitable access to the course for everybody. Um, so courses should act in accordance with the requirements set out in things such as the Equality Act 2010, but it shouldn't be limited to that. Um, it shouldn't be limited to the protected characteristics in the Equality Act. Um, for instance, things like social capital um, wouldn't be explicitly covered within um, the Equality Act, socioeconomic um, status, digital poverty, that kind of thing are all really important for accessibility, but wouldn't be covered by that legislation directly. Um, so things such as social capital, culture, sexuality, disability, neurodivergence, and other characteristics should not prevent students from having equitable access to the entire curriculum, um, is the wording within that section. Um, it's important that institutions should be proactively eliminating barriers. Again, I think we tend to think of that in terms of disability and uh, as Sarah pointed out yesterday, it's really important that we try and use a universal design for learning approach as much as possible. Because what you don't want is uh, certain groups of students having to work much harder than everybody else to access the curriculum. Again, I think I tend to think of that first in terms of disabled students, but that could also um, apply to other groups. For instance, a first in family to university student wouldn't be aware of um, some of the academic conventions. Um, and that can be quite a barrier to actually engaging. Um, so it's important to think about that across the board. Obviously, sometimes, particularly with disabled students, individual adjustments may be uh, required as well um, because of competing needs. But again, the important thing here is proactivity. Um, course designers should be thinking about building in flexibility um, to things like the teaching and the assessments so that as far as possible, you don't need to do that. We need to be thinking about accessibility right through from the admission stage. Um, is the way that we are selecting students um, disadvantaging specific groups? through to the curricula, pedagogy um, and assessments. A lot of examples we've had um, already throughout uh, the two days. We need to think about both the digital and physical resources. Has everybody got equitable access to them? Um, and I think within uh, biosciences, one of the more challenging areas to think about accessibility for are field work, practical elements and placements. Um, I'm not going to go through that in detail because, again, I think Sarah covered a lot of it from um, a disability perspective, but it's also thinking about things like finances, thinking about if you're traveling abroad, are you going to a country where it's safe for all of your student groups to travel? Um, I'm talking about potentially religion, potentially race, potentially sexuality. Um, you need to think about things like that. Um, just to summarise, 
Um, we hope that the addition of these social responsibility sections into the benchmark statements really act as a kind of push for all universities to be thinking about embedding these concepts within the curriculum. This will be published in February, March next year. Hopefully that code should link through to it, but you can find it on the QAA website anyway. Um, it is just the draft there at the moment, but I don't think there's going to be massive changes. Um, and the one for biomedical science is there too. We worked closely with the biomed side group, so they they align with each other quite well, which is important because a lot of people use both of them. They are aspirational, um, and the idea behind it is that everybody should feel represented, valued, and have full access to the curriculum. Just one final point. Um, they're already starting to have a bit of an impact in the media. Um, so certain areas of the media picked this up. Um, this is from the Mail Online, but certain other outlets had similar. Um, I think this was from about November, October time this year. Um, we particularly liked the fact they'd picked up this wording for the biomedical sciences one, because in fact, this is where we worked very closely with biomed science. Um, I believe Salma wrote this bit. Um, the document for biomedical science says students should critically engage with how the field has contributed to and benefited from social injustice and how influential scientists might have benefited from and perpetuated misogyny, racism, homophobia, ableism and other prejudices. And um, as usual, the, the phrase universities are ordered to go woke is being bandied about as if that's a bad thing. That's all I'll say. Um, and I'm going to leave it at that.